Back in the 1990s, other studios saw the massive success of Disney hits like Aladdin and The Lion King and realized they could produce animated films too. Warner Brothers was one of them, and why not? They produced the classic Looney Tunes shorts and throughout the 1980s had already been releasing compilation films with those characters. The legacy of Warner Brothers feature animation is one filled with noble ambitions, mismarketing, and desperately trying to figure out what to do next. They certainly had the talent, so what happened that led to the studio's closing barely a decade after it started and with only five films to speak of? Let's take a look. Warner Brothers feature animation started off promisingly with Space Jam, which was much hyped during the 1996 holiday season. Technically, the marketing campaign started before the film was even greenlit, as Michael Jordan starred in a series of Nike commercials with the Looney Tunes characters. They even hired the same director, Joe Pitka, to oversee Space Jam. The movie, being based on a commercial, is fitting, as it feels like nothing more than a 90-minute commercial, and that's one of my biggest problems with the movie. Rather than feeling like a natural story where the Looney Tunes interact with a basketball player, when I watch Space Jam, I just get the sense I'm being sold something. There is literally a scene where Daffy Duck kisses his own derriere with the Warner Brothers logo planted on it. It doesn't help that the Looney Tunes feel out of character. Chuck Jones said that Bugs Bunny would never ask Michael Jordan for help to defeat some aliens, and he's right. It seems odd to have Bugs, who has defeated many a villain, not beat them in seven minutes. The Looney Tunes can pull explosives and giant mallets out of thin air. Elmer Fudd is a hunter for crying out loud. And doesn't Marvin the Martian have a whole collection of ray guns? And yet, their plan is to abduct Michael Jordan to beat the Monstars in a basketball game. As a Looney Tunes fan, Space Jam is really frustrating to watch. And yet, I understand the nostalgia for this movie, because it is the most 90s movie ever made. I almost feel like I'm betraying my own generation for not liking this film. But it does have its merits, chief among them, the animation. The animation directors, Bruce Smith and Tony Savone, really pulled out all the stops in that department. The animation has a lot of polish to it, and the Looney Tunes move like they should. While Jordan's acting leaves a lot to be desired, the combination of live-action animation is pretty seamless. For all of its problems, Space Jam is harmless, and I can see why a lot of folks genuinely enjoy it, and why Warner Brothers is currently prepping a sequel with LeBron James starring and Ryan Coogler producing. I actually predict, once Space Jam 2 opens, that it will be a sizable box office hit, much like the first one was. Nostalgia does sell, after all. Meanwhile, the studio is trying to get a medieval set Arthurian adventure named Quest for Camelot off the ground. At one point, it was going to be a serious telling of the search for the Holy Grail, and then evolved into a movie about Excalibur, and then finally, after much executive meddling and micromanagement, came the final product. Quest for Camelot was a rather mixed bag, as despite the occasional sparks of inspiration, the studio heads mostly seemed intent on copying the Disney formula. So you have the spunky independent heroine, her dashing love interest, comedic loudmouth sidekicks, and musical numbers, which is rather different than the original pitch based on Vera Chapman's book, The King's Damosel. The movie could have been a unique animated film set in medieval times, and we instead got this rather cliched film with characters who are not terribly interesting. You'd think a two-headed dragon voiced by Don Rickles and Eric Idle would be really funny. Not really, they're just kind of annoying and don't serve much of an impact on the overall story. But we do have Gary Oldman as the villain, but he comes off more silly than threatening. Oh, and Jilla White voices a chicken. What is this movie? I'll grant you the combination of Ruger's henchmen with weapons is kind of a neat idea. While most of the songs are pretty forgettable, it's easy to see why The Prayer has remained a popular and well-regarded song. Although most people probably have no idea it came from Quest for Camelot. Or that it's the reason Quest for Camelot is an Academy Award nominated film. The movie itself was a box office flop, causing the studio to have second thoughts about having their own feature animation division. However, they pressed on with The Iron Giant, which was already in production. Ultimately, the failure of Quest for Camelot 
and nobody wanting to claim responsibility for it, led to Brad Bird and his team being left to their own devices. The result is a rather touching piece of animation about a boy and his robot. While the plot is rather similar to E.T. the Extraterrestrial, Bird makes up for it with a lot of clever sequences and his usual commentary about how human beings fear the unknown and special. Setting it in the 1950s also allowed the Iron Giant to stand out, as it evokes the paranoia of the Cold War, both in humorous undertones and the drama of the situation. Brad Bird allows for a number of quiet moments that really help develop and shape the characters, particularly the titular robotic giant. While I would not call it my favorite Brad Bird film, that would be Tomorrowland, there is a great deal to appreciate. As his feature directing debut, you can definitely see a lot of touches that would subsequently make The Incredibles and Ratatouille so special. Of course, because Warner Brothers did not really pay that much attention to The Iron Giant during its production, they did not spend a lot to market it, and it seemed to be overshadowed during the 1999 summer season. I actually did know about The Iron Giant, but I was just too hyped for the live-action Inspector Gadget movie, which came out around the same time, to pay much attention. Sorry, Brad Bird. But history has certainly been kinder to the Iron Giant. I imagine any money Warner Brothers lost from its theatrical release has already been made back with countless DVD and Blu-ray sales and frequent television airings. A few years later, they went back to the hybrid well with Osmosis Jones. A buddy cop movie set in the human body, it was certainly a clever concept to base a movie around, with a white blood cell fighting a virus invading his human city. Animation directors Tom Cito and Pete Kroon certainly brought a lot of energy to the scenes set inside of the human body, with a clear influence from many buddy cop movies that had come before it. But as a result, the film feels rather derivative, and I actually find it to be an almost obnoxious experience with not too many funny lines either. Now, unlike Space Jam, where the animated and live-action sequences were at least well-coordinated, a large portion of the animation on Osmosis Jones was already complete by the time they hired the Ferrelli brothers to direct the live-action portions. These scenes, featuring Bill Murray as Frank, include the Ferrelli's usual pension for gross-out gags. That's really what most of those sections consist of. Murray doing or eating something disgusting, which is a complete waste of his talents. The MPAA even gave the film a PG-13 rating, before the studio cut out a few jokes and swear words. Osmosis Jones proved to be a massive box office flop for the studio, only generating $14 million. Worldwide. It might be one of the biggest flops to ever get a Saturday morning cartoon, though. Around the early 2000s, something Warner Brothers tried desperately to do was revive interest in the Looney Tunes. There was an attempt to make a Space Jam sequel, which did not pan out. Then they tried turning it into a secret agent movie called Spy Jam, starring Jackie Chan, which also did not happen. Finally, Joe Dante came in with a pitch that would treat the Looney Tunes with respect in what he called the anti-Space Jam. I think the final result, Looney Tunes Back in Action, was a major improvement and actually quite funny. While you do have Brendan Fraser, Jenna Elfman, and Steve Martin hamming it up, the movie is mainly focused on showing the difficult relationship between Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck. This was a nice expansion on what Chuck Jones had been doing with the characters for many years, and the film really captures Daffy's desperation for the spotlight. I've often said that Daffy Duck is the most well-developed character in cinematic history, and back in action further showed what a genuinely three-dimensional personality he is. Dante and animation director Eric Goldberg works so well in sync with a number of inspired sequences, the best being Elmer Fudd, Bugs and Daffy running through famous paintings at the Louvre, with the animators utilizing a wide range of appropriate art styles. The movie even makes fun of the heavy commercialism that was so commonly seen in Space Jam. I know Joe Dante does not look back too fondly on the making of the film, as Warner Brothers was very controlling, which is ironic for a movie where one of the main characters is a controlling Warner Brothers executive. However, I still think the film holds up well as a humorous addition to the Looney Tunes legacy with a lot of great gags. Unfortunately, the audience was not nearly as enthusiastic about a new Looney Tunes movie like they were in 1996, and Back in Action's box office failure 
closed the door on Warner Brothers feature animation, which was a shame, as it was a unit with a lot of potential. They certainly had the talent, but it did not seem like the studio gave them the best support. Now, Warner Brothers did not entirely abandon producing animation for the big screen. There was a period when they allowed live-action directors to make animated films about birds. They had a big success with George Miller's Happy Feet, which also won the Oscar for Best Animated Feature. That was followed a few years later by Zack Snyder's OWL movie Legend of the Guardians and the Happy Feet sequel. Finally, they decided the time was right to relaunch the animation division with the creation of the Warner Animation Group, which this time would be headed by actual filmmakers and not executives. The creative head of WAG, Allison Abate, has even been a producer on some highly regarded animated films, including The Iron Giant. I think Warner Brothers seems to have a better understanding of why their previous animation studio did not last long, and are giving the filmmakers more space to be creative, and are actually bothering to properly market the films. There's been a healthy balance of Lego movies and original features, and I expect the Warner Animation Group will be around for many, many years. See you next time.